Okay, welcome to Destination Cuisine. This is our summer series, and this is episode two, who's going to kick off with good old Chef Quasi Kwa from Comfort Kitchen, and he's going to share the secrets of making the perfect Zatar butter, brown butter trout with smoked eggplant puree. And make sure you follow him on IG at Comfort Kitchen Boss. And this episode, we're going to all stay muted. We're going to use the chat for your questions. Um, feel free um, to ask questions as we go along. If you do have any technical issues, just keep in mind, you could always switch over your audio. And the way you do it is you just hit that mute button there. You switch to your phone audio. You make sure you pair your participant ID. And as always, we use your reactions as well as the chat. I'm going to switch things over now to um, Linda Palmer, who's going to introduce um, UFI and our chef. My Linda. name is Linda Palmer, and I'm the Special Projects Manager at Urban Farming Institute on behalf of our CEO, Patricia Spence, who you just saw a moment ago. <laughs> um, our board of directors and staff, we want to welcome you to Destination Cuisine which is an exploration of global food presented by local chefs whose cooking is reflective of their native homes and the diverse cultures that make up the city of Boston. Tonight, we're excited about our second episode of our summer series, which is featuring Kwasi Kwa. He's a native of Ghana, and he's been honing his culinary skills at various kitchens in the Boston area. His passion has led him from his early start at High Rise cafe and bakery in 2010, to the world of large-scale corporate catering at Fireside and BG events in 2016. He is currently the chef partner at Comfort Kitchen, a restaurant celebrating the flavors and ingredients of the African diaspora. It's set to open December of this year in Boston's Upman's Corner, and we are eagerly awaiting it. In addition to being a cafe, um, Comfort Kitchen's also a community meeting space and a food incubator dedicated to fostering collaboration, cross-cultural understanding and community engagement. Just let me tell you a little bit more and then we can get started with Chef Kwasi Kwa. He's also the chef founder of the Chop Bar, a pop-up dinner series showcasing global street food concepts with a twist. Barry leads menu creation, sourcing and cooking for monthly pop-up series in various locations. The name's inspiration came from the tiny roadside restaurants of his Ghanaian childhood. Aside from English, he's multilingual. He speaks Twi, Spanish, and Portuguese that he picked up through years of working in kitchens. So without further ado, I give you Chef Quasi Qua. Hello, hello, hello. Thank you, Linda. Thank you, Angela. Um, thank you, UFI. Welcome. Um, like Linda, as uh, Angela mentioned, we're going to be cooking some fun stuff today. Um, I'm so happy everybody was able to join today. Um, you know, one of the things I love about just collaborating with UFI is because is that we're able to just have conversations, simple conversations about food. And ingredients and where we could take it. Um, one of the things that I thought about when we were kind of hashing out this plan to do this part this um, series was what's the best way to celebrate ingredients that generally will not be talked about but people think about it but they, they, they won't gravitate towards it as much. And one of the very important things about our menu process at Comfort Kitchen is we are essentially trying to follow the history of food. So our whole concept is about global comfort food, but really trying to follow the history of the ingredients that have traveled, not just through the African diaspora, but through the Americas and all and ingredients that have made their way through Asia and back. Um, one of the most important things about this dish that we're going to do today, it's something very fresh, something very simple, but it's extremely delicious and extremely flavorful. And, you know, 
Um, I hope you guys will enjoy it as much as I do. It was one of the items that was on our last pop-up menu last year. And, you know, throughout this whole thing, I'm going to, I'm going to mention a bunch of things that every time I say cheat code, it's going to be like, all right, this is how you're going to save yourself time and money. That's what, anytime you hear cheat code, that's what it is. You know, um, I feel like for so many years and for a long time, you know, food and the food industry has always kind of presented itself as this mysterious thing. But one of the things that we're trying to do is kind of debunk the idea of food being complicated if it's, if it's in a restaurant setting, right? And that's what we're, we're gonna try to achieve here. So, you know, if you look at the menu, so the menu that was presented feeds um, four people, but um, today we're gonna make two, well, one or two, because in my tiny little kitchen and my tiny apartment is just myself, my wife and my beautiful cat children, <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, um, we're going to, uh, on my, on my end, I'm going to make two of the, two, uh, one or two of the dishes, but the menu that you guys have presented to you should be able to feed four. And it's, it's very crucial to know that, you know, everything to in the menu is not restrictive to the menu. One of the things that we always talk about is that, you know, food is not linear, you know, it's not like, oh it has to be this or nothing else. You know, there's substitutes for everything. So please be in touch, be engaged with your questions. Any questions you have, we are more than happy to answer them. Substitutions, you know, in this time where everything is seemingly, so, not seemingly so expensive, um, there's always uh, room for adjustments. So I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. But with that said, we're gonna go into the we're gonna go into the recipe, and then we could just talk about any questions anybody have before I start. Any questions initially? No, good. We'll go. Okay, so we're doing um, the brown butter, the zatar brown butter trout, and it's gonna go with an, a smoked eggplant puree and tomato salad. I'm gonna give a little background on why this menu item became a thing it's um the focus of this menu item was so in this particular situation we were researching um zatar which is well zatar and urfa chili which are two spices that are very synonymous to north africa and have traveled through the mediterranean all the way through italy back to france and back to africa and those were the things that we wanted to highlight in this particular dish. Um, the second thing is we wanted to highlight the eggplant. You know, the, in, in the culinary world, there's certain ingredients that generally don't get a chance to be the star of the dish for a while. They're always playing a second or a supporting role. And eggplant is one of them. But the truth is eggplant has, it's a very nutritional ingredient and it's also a very nourishing situation where it's, it's almost considered a filler ingredient. So if you look at vegetarian dishes and dishes that don't really require protein, there's always a situation with eggplant or okra, or this is why you see these ingredients in uh, soups and stews. And for us, when we're researching these things, we're always looking at ingredients that we can follow throughout continents, right? And one of the things that was really important to us was that we wanted to make the eggplant so delicious that even if you haven't had it, we wanted to, we wanted to push you to try it. And if you did try it and you didn't like it, we wanted to present it in a different way where you would at least be like, oh, I can work with that. You know what I mean? So we're, we're really trying to just kind of turn ingredients around and really trying to be very experimentative and creative with everything that we're doing. 
Chef, that sounds wonderful about eggplant because I know a lot of people hear eggplant and they go, ooh, ooh. Right, right. <laughs> and, and this is what we're trying to do. We're trying to debunk everything, everything and anything we can with food, you know. And eggplant is definitely one of those that's up there that's it's just a very pol polarizing ingredient. And I can guarantee I stand behind this recipe if you make it at home. Anybody that says they don't like it, have them call me. We'll talk about it. <laughs> so with that, with that said, we're going to get started. So in the recipe, it's, you know, you have the eggplant puree, you have the tomato salad, and then you have the actual brown butter trout. The first thing we're going to do is roast the eggplant. Um, the, that's because that's going to take the most time. And we're going to do a little bit, a little bit of Hollywood magic on our side here just to make sure we're not taking, every, it, we're not taking too much of everybody's time. Um, the first thing we do, so one of the things, um, I love this eggplant puree because it reminds me of something that we used to do in Ghana. It, it was a basic eggplant stew, but it had so many components and it took, it, it took a long time to cook, right? So when we were thinking about this, item, I was thinking, all right, how can we impart all that flavor into this without taking that extra time to have a stew and simmer for almost like hours and hours and hours? This is the thing. What we're going to do is we're going to coat this with a little bit of olive oil. We're going to salt it. And then we're going to uh, add um, cumin, cayenne, and smoked paprika. We're going to rub all that on it and we're going to pop it in the oven. And when that's and when that's in and cooking, we're going to move on to the rest of our components here. All right. So just kind of just rubbing all this stuff in. The olive oil gives it a little bit of moisture so that it doesn't dry out while it's in the oven. And it, it also helps all the hot uh, spices adhere to the actual eggplant. So you're not having a, you know, you're not really just getting watery, flavorless eggplant. Chef, I know from cooking eggplant myself, um, if you could just say about how much oil you'd put on the eggplant because eggplant tends to really absorb um, yes. oil. This is true. So I wouldn't go more than a tablespoon because the oil is just to keep it coated. Okay. What's gonna happen is when we put this in the oven and it roasts, it's just gonna help all these spices. So this spice, that, this spice mix that I'm putting on here is the cayenne, the cumin, the smoked paprika. This is where you get the smoked eggplant from because the smoked paprika gives it a really smoky and earthy flavor. And then we just rub that all on there. And we're just gonna go in the oven with it. We're gonna go in the oven, skin side up. I mean, skin side down, I should say. And in the oven, you're going at 400. And this, this is gonna take about 20 minutes to roast. And depending on how powerful your oven is, 20 minutes, 20 minutes to 30 minutes, but 20 minutes is the, the minimum. It has to, you, you want the eggplant to roast where it's very soft to the touch where when you poke your hand in it, it just kind of falls right through the eggplant, right? We're gonna go in there. So chef, I've got another quick question for you. What if you can't find the um, Orpha chili and the za'atar? Uh, the Orpha chili and the za'atar? Um, so it's a, there's a hard, there's not, much of a substitute for the za'atar, but the urfa chili, you could always do Calabrian chili. You could do any chili that's mild and not hot to taste. Um, you could do, uh, what's it called? Excuse me. Um, anything that comes from the uh, bell pepper, the dry bell pepper chilies. Okay. And Calabrian, Calabrian chili being one of them. Um, za'atar, so za'atar is a very like earthy, but also it has citrus notes. So anything from, I'm trying to think the best way to explain this. Think um, adobo meets chilies. 
that, sure. that's literally what Zatar kind of mixes into. It's, it's a little bit on the spicy side, but it's not too spicy and it's very, very citrusy. So it doesn't get too crazy. And the thing is, Zatar has become one of my favorite spices to work with because it's just, it's applicable to everything. And, you know, one of the things that we do at Comfort Kitchen, we're, we're always play, playing around with spice mixes. And very recently, actually, we were doing something with um, cumin, coriander, and we added, um, what, what was it? Cardamom. So cumin, coriander, car cardamom, and a, a touch of um, cayenne pepper. And it created a flavor profile that we didn't really expect. But that's also something that I think, green cardamom specifically, that's something that I think resembles the tar a little bit. And the only difference with the spice mixes that we do and what Zatar essentially is, Zatar always has um, sesame seeds in it. And that sesame gives it that little bit of a kick. Well, not a kick, but um, it adds to the depth of the flavor of the spice mix, if you would. All right, so now we have our eggplant in. Now we're gonna move into making our chimichurri. And, you know, like I mentioned before, we're gonna be talking about cheat codes. Cheat code number one, you can make the eggplant puree the day before. That will save you time. You know what I mean? Um, because the eggplant puree is so simple and it doesn't have too many additive ingredients, it's very um, stable, stable in the sense that it doesn't have to be refrigerated. Well, no, it has to be refrigerated, but as it sits, it's not gonna go bad fast. So you can make it the day before. Cheat code number two, you can make the chimichurri ahead of time. Not just not too far ahead of time because um, the thing with this particular chimichurri is like spring onion or scallion, whichever you choose to use, with the acid that goes into this, um, it will break down the scallion or spring onion very fast. So you want there to be some textural notes to the actual chimichurri, right? Um, if you do it too far ahead of time, the fibers in the scallion will break down and it's just gonna get really, really slimy. So you just don't wanna make it too far ahead of time, but you could make it ahead of time like an hour or two before. Right, so we're gonna do the chimichurri and then we're gonna move on to the rest of the dish, right? So for the chimichurri, you're just gonna rough chop a bunch of, a bunch of the scallion. And for the recipe, we're just gonna combine all these components. And you know, one of the things that I always realize is that when we talk about recipes and when we do you know, ingredients for stuff, the wording that is in the recipe can tend to be a little intimidating. But the truth is when we're talking about spring onion chimichurri, we're basically making a sauce. We're just not making a smooth sauce. We're making a sauce, like chimichurri is a basic herb sauce, right? But you can make it with anything you want. Also, cheat code. With scallions, Let's see if we can find it. Yeah. Anytime you do your scallions, save the stems. You can grow scallions twice, two rounds at a time, just by adding some water, let it sit. In a couple of days, you grow new scallions. That's a cheat code. You might not have to buy scallions every day, but I don't know if you use scallions all the time, but that's a cheat code. Um, with the scallions that we have in here, we're gonna add our green chilies, right? And the thing is, we just want these items to be proportional in terms of size, just because we don't want them to cure, one to cure faster than the other. So with the green chilies, and you could choose to use whatever green chili you want, for this particular purpose, we're doing jalapeno, but personally, I'm very much into, um, what's it called? Thai chilies, Thai green chilies. 
they're just the right amount of spice and they're not too too empowered too overbearing we're gonna go in here with the jalapeno and i'm gonna add a little bit of um ginger paste so one of the things with us at comfort kitchen this three ingredients that you'll never find absent in any of our recipes. Onion, garlic, ginger. Ginger is very, to us, ginger is super important because ginger is one of those ingredients that you do find all across the globe. And, you know, keeping in, keeping in um, consistency with the idea of trying to track ingredients that have traveled all across the globe, ginger is one of them. You will find ginger pretty much anywhere you go. In any cuisine that you find, there's ginger prevalence somewhere there, right? So I'm gonna just grate a little bit of just ginger in here. And you could be doing this, all of this while you're, all, all of this while your uh, eggplant is going, right? And you know, if you, one of the things about ginger, the three ingredients that I spoke about, you'll find it in Asian cuisine, you'll find it in African cuisine, you'll find it in American cuisine, South American cuisine, all of those, there's so many cultures that utilize what I like to call the trifecta, you know what I mean? And it makes the world of difference in terms of flavor especially when you put all three of them together, right? So this chimichurri, all that it needs now, a little bit of salt, a little bit of olive oil, and we're gonna add some sherry vinegar to it, and it's done. We're just gonna let it sit and do its thing. Olive oil, a little bit of sherry here. Is sherry vinegar easy to find in the stores? Yes, it is. Okay. So I would either sherry or champagne vinegar. Uh, so the idea for this um, chimichurri, you don't want it to be too, you don't want the vinegar to be too acidic because like I wouldn't do a distilled white wine vinegar with this because it will break down the scallions so fast, you, faster than you're able to se uh, serve it. But you definitely want to do something like a sherry or a champagne vinegar. And, you know, because it's such a fresh um, component to the dish, if you have the opportunity to get something that's really nice that you enjoy, do it. Because it will add to the flavor of the chimichurri, right? I'm gonna go there. And then you're essentially just mixing the whole thing. So when I'm talking about a chimichurri is not necessarily complicated. Chimichurri is essentially an herb sauce that's not puree, right? And this is the basic consistency of your average chimichurri. You know what I mean? So you have the coarseness of all, all the components that are in there and you can still taste it, but you still have the acid and the fat that goes in it. That's, that's all it is. So our chimichurri is all set. We're gonna sit that aside, let it marinate and do its thing. Now we're gonna work on our tomato salad, right? So the tomato salad, on the recipe, it, it calls for heirloom tomatoes. And heirloom tomatoes are those ugly but colorful tomatoes that are in your, in the section that there's not plum tomatoes. So. I personally love to use the heirloom tomatoes because um, they're, I find them to be much more flavorful than like plum or vine tomatoes. But also around this time of the year, we get such an amazing collection of tomatoes and it's just, it's just the flavor in the tomatoes are just unmatched to any other, uh, any other time of the year. Now, 
Oh, cheat code. Don't refrigerate your tomatoes. I, I can't stress this enough. Um, you know, I, I don't know if anybody has ever thought about it. It's like, why do we buy produce that's not refrigerated in the store, but we bring it home and refrigerate it? That's, you know, that, and for tomatoes, especially when you refrigerate it, it just kind of turns the texture very mealy and it, it becomes very bland. So that's your cheat code right there. Don't refrigerate your tomatoes. When you get them, let them sit on a counter somewhere and let them do their thing. If you plan on eating them in a couple of days, just leave them out. It's better for the tomato. So for the salad, this particular tomatoes, seeds and all, we don't have to do anything to it. We're just gonna go right in here, right? And I like to leave them in larger chunks just because, again, it gives a lot more texture to the dish. You don't have to cut them down too small. Also, you don't have to relegate yourself to heirloom tomatoes or larger format heirloom tomatoes. This, is, this goes back to the conversation we were having before where it's like, food is not linear. You can really decide what you want to have happen in whatever dish you're making. And the tomato salad in this case is where you can get as jazzy as you want. You know, I like to add herbs to my, my salads. It's not even just this tomato salad. Like I add parsley, mint, dill if need be to my tomato salad. I generally just dress my salad with olive oil and vinegar. And with those herbs, you're able to get a a taste and flow flavor profile that you don't have to you don't really need a vinaigrette you don't need all this extra stuff right One. all right so we got our tomatoes all set here i'm gonna give our board a quick reset and then we're gonna come back to the the main star, the main attraction of this show here. So we're gonna check on our eggplants, see how they're doing. Realistically, I want I want to be able to show you guys what the eggplant should feel like before it comes out of the oven. All right. All right. So we're still a fair amount to go there. All right, so we got our stuff for the tomato salad. We're gonna chop all our herbs. Like I said, I like to add a few herbs to my, my salad. So we're gonna do a little bit of this parsley here. We're gonna do a little bit of mint. And and some salt and olive oil. And that's really all that is gonna be for the salad. But again, you know, when we, when I was talking earlier about like, just food can be simple and still delicious all at the same time, right? One of the things that, one of the first things that I learned as a cook was that the difference between a phenomenal dish and a mediocre dish is how you're able to kind of layer those flavors and layer those spices and kind of have them dance together all at the same time. And this is this dish, I think, encompasses that theory, right? So tomatoes are done. We got herbs. I'm going to wait to mix the tomato salad. I'm going to wait until the, the trout comes out so that it's not just sitting um, because what's, what happens is if you mix a, the tomatoes with the salt and all the components, it just leaches a lot of liquid and you get to that mealiness that we're trying to avoid to begin with. So eggplant is still going, but we kind of demonstrated how the eggplant should be set up, right? When the eggplant comes out, I want to show how, how it should feel to the touch before you puree it. But... We also have a Hollywood magic moment here where we have eggplant puree ready to go. 
So we'll be able to just see the texture of where it's at and then we'll go from there, okay? So now we're gonna work on our trout. The trout is the, the fun parts, the fun bits. One of the things that I like to do, so um, I use rice flour, but you don't have to use rice flour. You can use whatever flour that you want. If it's, you know, all purpose flour or whatever. The, the, the purpose of the flour is just to kind of give the skin of the fish that light, crispy feel, right? I use rice flour, well, for two reasons. Rice flour, I think, gives it that nice fry where it's very light and airy. Um, I, it reminds me almost like a tempura batter. If you ever had tempura, it's like, it's just, it's deep fried, but it's super light and airy. But I also use rice flour, rice flour for selfish reasons because, you know, my other half happens to be gluten free. So every time we're working on recipes, I'm always looking for ways to make it gluten free. Because, I mean, let's face it, what's the point of cooking it if your loved ones can't have it, right? So with the fish, so this is, this is what your average zatar looks like. And you could get it in a ground form, but if you look closely to this, you could see the toasted sesame seeds in there, right? And it has a fair amount of herbs and different combinations of spices in it. But, oh man, I wish you guys could smell this. Um, I don't know how to describe it in smell here, but it's, you could definitely tell the sesame in it, but you could also smell all the herbs in it. In fact, there's a specific herb in here that I feel like reminds me of thyme almost. So with the zatar, I go right into the, the flour. Just mix it right into the flour. I think it gives it an even coat when you do the fish. The only thing I don't do, I don't do salt in the mixture because what happens with salt when you mix it into the drudge, it just sinks to the bottom of the drudge. So then you think you've salted the drudge, but really all the salt is at the bottom and you're just kind of doing the flour and whatever else you added to it. So I salt separately, just so that you can get that, the flavor of that salt. There you go. And then we'll move on to our trout. So normally I am a huge fan of whole fish. The thing with trout is, trout is hard to source whole. So in this instance, we're gonna do the head off. But I love the head on because anybody that knows me will tell you I love fish heads, one. And two, <laughs> I just enjoy a whole fish. So in this instance, we got the trout already cleaned with the head off and we're just gonna salt, drudge it, and we're gonna go. Again, like I said, you could substitute with any fish that is of preference. Um, porgies are a good substitute, bronzino is a good substitute, cod, halibut, all those light flaky fishes are a good substitute. One of the reasons we went with trout with this particular recipe was because we were trying to highlight ingredients of that region and trout was is so common in that region that we it, it just fit kind of, it just fit like a glove. So we wanted to just make it a whole situation with that. So what I'm gonna do next, I'm just gonna drudge the fish. And you can get the fish cleaned at your local fishery. Um, I generally go to Super 88, believe it or not. They usually have very, very fresh seafood. And you know, one of the tricks of the trade here is if you're looking to do fresh seafood, if you're looking for fresh seafood, look at the eyes of the fish. If it's cloudy, it's not fresh. So one of the things that I look for when I'm going to get seafood is really trying to search for that non-cloudy eyes. Chef, where is Super 88? 
Super 88, there's a lot of locations of Super 88 around the city. It's a, it's a predominantly Asian market. They sell a lot of other stuff, but they sell a lot of seafood that you otherwise would not find in your local grocery store. Um, the one that I go to is in Central Square, and there's also one in Malden that has a more extensive seafood market. There's also one in Brighton, Mass, too. Yes, yes. All right. So with this, we're going to salt now. And one of the important things about cooking fish or searing fish in general, right, is a lot of people assume you want to go high heat right off the bat. Not necessary, because what happens when you go high heat right off the bat is the, the skin of the fish, especially if you're cooking skin on fish, sticks to the pan. It's important to go very, very low heat, let the oil come to temp, and then once the fish is in and it's kind of doing its thing, then you bring the temperature up, then you finish it however you want to. But high heat, you know, when people think sear, they automatically go to high heat, extreme high heat, you know. But in the case of fish, it's very different. You have to start slow or start medium and then gradually bring the heat to where it needs to be. We're going to wait for our pan to get to temp here. And in the meantime, we'll check on our eggplant. Okay, so eggplant. When you touch the eggplant without effort, if your finger goes through without effort, your eggplant is done. So th this eggplant is essentially done. Anytime you do that and it goes right through, it's done. If you can make dimples in there, you're pretty much there. Can you put it on the cutting board so we can get a close up of that? Yeah, absolutely. yeah there you go. All right. Cool. So as I'm touching it, my finger is going right through. That's done. And like I said, based on depending on how um, how powerful your oven gets, you can reach this in 20 minutes. And at the very most, 30 minutes will get you there. Okay. We're gonna put this to the side. And normally, what will be happening with this eggplant actually? I think I can show you this right now while we're waiting for this pan to get hot. So with the eggplant, normally what we will be doing at the restaurant is just taking the eggplant just like that, right? And we're going to take a spoon. We'll turn it this way down. And we would just scrape the contents of the eggplant into a bowl, right? Just like that. Just like so. So this is what you would see once you scrape it out. And normally you could just let it sit and cool before you puree it, but it doesn't really make a difference whether you puree it hot or cold. But one of the things that I do advise is like you wait till it cools down a little bit more because when it cools down, the salt contents builds up. So if you wanna adjust your season to taste, you wanna wait till it's a little bit more cool so that you can get a better sense of how the seasoning is before you add more season, because you know you can always add more, but you can't take more. You can't take some out. You know, in terms of salt, like you can, you can always add a little more salt, but you can never take salt out when you once you've seasoned. So, but this is the consistency you're looking for, and you just puree it. Quick pulse, nothing too aggressive. Realistically, the consistency that you're looking for is this this should be the end product, right? So it gives it a nice color with all the seasoning. 
but it's almost like a double pureed uh, mash, if you would. We're gonna put this to the side. All right, now we're gonna get to our fish. I think we're there. Chef, if you make too much of the eggplant puree, where else can you use it in your um, cooking? You know, I've used this eggplant puree as a dip, like in a, in a chips and dip situation. You could, it's because of all the flavors that we've already imparted into it. I've used this in a chip and, chips and dip situation, adding a little bit of truffle oil and it just, it takes it to the next level, honestly. I don't know. Um, so baba ganoush, it's, it's almost like a full version of baba ganoush. Okay. Yeah. So you get, there's many applications you can use it for. And with the fish, it just works well. It works well with the fish, but it's also very versatile. You could use, I've, you could butter a piece of toast with this and just have it as is with some avocado. Right. Making me hungry. <laughs> We're going to get ready to go in with our fish here. All right, I'm going to turn this fan on. Hopefully, you guys hear the fan at all? Or no, we good. Nope, you're good. So with the fish, when you're coming out of the drudge, you just want to shake off that excess flour. And then I usually go skin side down. And then after the flip, we go right into the oven. Definitely want to make sure you have enough fat in your pan so it doesn't scorch the actual fish. Any recommendations for oil that you're using to um, um, pan sear? Well, right now I'm using olive oil, but it's an olive oil blend. So realistically, when you want to sear, canola oil is your best bet, but because we're not going scorching hot pan, olive oil is okay. Because okay. olive oil has a higher smoking point. So when it gets to that high temperature, it starts to smoke. But in, like I said, like I mentioned earlier, in this particular case, we're not trying to get the pan scorching hot. So olive oil is fine in this. Um, I prefer olive oil because it, it just adds to that depth of flavor for fish. But if I was doing a meat or something like that, I would probably do canola first. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So basically what we're going to do with this fish, we're, we're going to let it sear, let the skin get very nice and light crispy. Then we're going to finish it in the oven. We're going to let it finish cooking in the oven. We're going to pull it out. We're going to add our butter and let the butter brown in the pan. And then we're going to baste it with the butter so it gets that extra richness on top of it. Light squeeze of lemon juice and then we're there. Chef, do you have any cheat codes for busy, I won't just say moms, but for just busy cooks? Any additional cheat codes? Any additional cheat codes? Well, what would we say? We're at an hour here. Um, well, making the eggplant puree definitely will save you time. The fish itself takes literally 10 minutes, max. Um, the tomato salad, based on how many people you're cooking for, should not be more than 10 minutes. Um, 
I think that's all the cheat codes I have right now. <laughs> no, those so are we'll great. get more cheat codes as, as we go along. Again, the chimichurri you can make ahead of time. You just can't make it too far ahead of time. That's the only thing, you know. But you want to you want to clarify the type of trap where you're only making or cooking the fish for service or to to plate up. I think Angela was about to ask a question, but I think I heard. Oprah. I know there are different kinds of trout. There's rainbow trout, there's sea trout. Do you have a um, preference for this recipe? So there is no preference for this recipe. Like I said, you could interchange this with any fish that you're comfortable with. I just suggest that you don't do like a fatty fish like salmon, just because the dish itself is super rich and salmon will just add to that richness and it's just, it's just too much, right? But any light flaky fish will work for this. Whatever your preference is, it works. So I'm going to turn this. So this is what your fish should be looking like before it goes in the oven. Right? And we're just going to pop it in the oven, let it finish in the oven. And then we'll come back and baste with the brown butter. At this point, we can start completing our tomato salad. And like I said, for the tomato salad, nothing too crazy. It's also something that you can get, you can get creative. I, like I said, I choose tomatoes at this time of the year because we get really amazing tomatoes. Like, look at these tomatoes. We got like purple and red and and the flavor is just amazing so with this simple olive oil salt that's it and the herbs into it and that ends it right there right just a touch of that a little bit of salt there And sometimes I would do a little bit of the Urfa chili just because we're feeling, we're feeling funky a little bit, right? And then the mint. A touch of this parsley. And then just mixing it all together. And once that fish comes out, we'll be ready to plate. So on your plate, and of course you could decide how you want to do this, but um, for the presentation purposes of this, because you know we gotta. We got to make it look nice, right? This one, set our plate, our plant. All right. I like to just land on the side with the tomatoes. And our fish will just land right on top of the tomatoes there. I like to use a slotted spoon with the tomatoes because like I was saying, it does leach quite a bit and you don't want an excess of it, of the liquid on there. And if you have access to really nice tomatoes, I always say more tomato, the better. More tomato, the better. All right. Here we go. Now we're going to check on our fish real quick.
So right about this time is where we add our butter. And when you add the butter, you want the butter to sit in the pan and it's gonna foam. You want the butter to just foam all the way until the foam subsides. That's where you get your brown butter situation. And you, if you have extra zatar, I say just add it. It makes for a better finish. We're gonna let that do its thing for a second while we're waiting. Any questions so far? Yep, this is your chance to ask because we will be wrapping up shortly. Yes. I wish I was there to eat it. <laughs> <laughs> well, Chef, while we're waiting, you wanna talk about the restaurant? Yes, so Comfort Kitchen, we're opening in September in Upham's Corner, um, 611 Columbia, Columbia Street, Columbia, Columbia Road in Dorchester. Um, we've been waiting quite a bit, and up until now, we were fortunate enough to be able to continue the project, and now that we're in a good space, I think it's about time that we just open so that we can share a lot more of these dishes with the rest of the world. What now type of restaurant? On Columbia Road, a historic location? I'm sorry? Is your location historic in a, in a historic building? Yes. We're in um, the, the original comfort station in Boston. Will you just be open right for now, dinner? I'm just basting this fish just so it gets all the brown butter that it can get. Because the brown butter also helps with the cooking process. We're, all, we're almost poaching the fish in the brown butter. And then we're going to pop it in one more time. Let it finish. And we'll be good to go. So there are a few questions in the chat. One person yes. asked, can you use a cast iron skillet for hand searing the fish? Yes, you can. You absolutely can. Any nonstick pan will work perfectly for it. Okay. And are you catering as well? We are catering. Um, unfortunately, right now, we're in a holding pattern with our catering and um, private events situation because um, we're working out of a satellite kitchen now. So it takes a lot of coordinating to be able to execute an event. But yes, we are catering and we will be catering once we open. But right now it does take a lot more effort. So the more advanced notice we have, the better it is for us. And I also think I heard a question from Mickey Gray. Yes. I wanted to know um, what would your menu be? And will you be only be open for dinner? Um, we're actually going to be a cafe by day and a restaurant and a full functioning restaurant by night. So mm -hmm. we're going to be opening. We're going to be open during the day. You're going to be busy. Yeah. Wow. We're ready. We're ready for the challenge. Oh, wow. Can, can we address Dan's question about is that an induction oven, uh, induction stovetop being used? So can this you just is our repeat your question a little bit louder? She wanted to know if it was an induction oven or an induction stove. What I have here, yes, it's an induction stove. All right. So. What some adju need adjustments need to be made with a different type stove? I'm sorry? Would some adjustments have to be made in terms of cooking times with a, um, a non-induction stove? Oh, no, absolutely not. Okay. It's, it's the same time frame all around. Okay. 
So yeah. now we have our little chimichurri here on the side, a little bit. You can add as much or as little as you want. And then we just go in. A little bit of micro celery and micro cilantro. Yummy. And that's it. Yummy. Beautiful. That is your whole dish. Beautiful. Yummy. Don't forget, don't forget to take a picture of the plated dish for us. <laughs> thank, thank you. you. Absolutely. Thank you. Oh, thank you guys for joining me here. Okay. Three final questions okay. that we wrap up right now. In terms of the ginger that you use, do you use crystallized ginger or ginger root? Um, crystallized? No, I use fresh ginger. Okay. Fresh grated ginger. Do you take the outside skin off or do you grate it with skin? It depends. If I have organic ginger, I would just use the skin. But mm -hmm. generally, around here, we don't really get organic ginger. So I always take the skin off before I use it. Yeah, me too. Okay. Thank you. So I hope I don't mispronounce this. Um, Beatrice or Beatrice um, is asking, how do you, we get in touch with you? Um, they're having an event in September. So it sounds like you want some catering. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, they can reach out to us on our Instagram. Um, they could reach us, reach out to us by email, comfortkitchenbos at gmail.com. That's our email handle. And on Instagram, we're comfortkitchenbos. Um, we do have like, we have a, a somebody man in that station all the time. So as long as they email us or reach out on, on Instagram, we're able to make that happen. And I believe Angela is going to bring up some information at the end of the session um, for how to contact you. Yes. Yes. Um, well, I don't have the Gmail, but the website is in the chat there. Yes. Okay. okay. Are there any more questions? We also have a catering form on our website that folks can click on and it'll take them straight to the catering um, email if they're just inquiring just about catering. Angela, could you bring up our sponsors that slide for me? Yes, let's do that. Mm -hmm. Before I get that, I would really be remiss if I didn't tell you about our July 19th chef. Um, it will be Chef Ali Lopez. She's a co-founder of Open Hearth Gatherings, and she's got over 15 years of experience in the food industry. She's born in Mexico, raised in Somerville, and she's got a huge appreciation for New England seasonality, fires, and tacos. Yes. So... Join us. We'll have more information um, soon on our website. Um, and you are now a part of our contact list. So we'll have more information about um, Chef Ali Lopez. Um, um, you can also her... register. Just scan the QR code here and you can register. And Angela, if you could just bring up our sponsors again, because I'd be remiss if I didn't mention them. Um, but before I do that, I guess I'll do that. No, I'll talk about our farm stands. <laughs> Visit us as of July the 15th um, for Urban Farming Institute's fifth annual um, farm stand. We're at the historic Fowler Clark Epstein Farm. We'll have vegetables, herbs, and fruit um, locally grown. And our hours are on Fridays from one to four. We accept cash credit, EBT, SNAP, and all sorts of other um, uh, coupons. Um, so join us and we'll be going through November the 18th. And now I really would like to thank our sponsors. Um, <laughs> the Ajana Foundation, the Barr Foundation, Bromley Charitable Trust, Cummings Foundation, 
Janet Tiampo and David Parker, John Hancock and State Street Foundation. And I would also like to um, do special thanks to Dutch Pot, who has made these chefs possible that you've seen for the last two weeks and that you will see on the 19th and that you will see in the fall for our fall series. We've got three chefs who will be coming to you. And I just wanna leave you with this. We have this saying at Urban Farming Institute, we don't just grow food, we grow people. Mm. So join us um, at our farm stand and look at our website for the different events that we'll have um, during the coming year. Thank you so much. And please don't forget to join Quasi at the Boston Jerk Fest on July the 2nd. We'll be doing a cooking demo. Quasi, do you know what time your demo is or is it throughout the um, Jerk it's Fest? Gonna, it's going to be 12 to 2. Okay. So join him 12 to 2 at the Jerk Fest. It's going to be at the Harvard Athletic Center. Can you cut it to the Thank you. Well, thank you. I, I thought thank I heard so much. Thank you. Uh, and have a wonderful Thank you. Night. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Bye -bye. And you'll also get um, a copy of the re uh, recipe emailed as well, but you can always go to the website. It'll be up there by Thursday, as well as the recording um, if you want to check out the replay. Okay. Thank you, Chef. Bye. Thank you for Bye. having Thank me. You all. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. Hope to see you on July the 19th at 6.30 for Chef Ali Lopez. Yeah. Thank you.